global warming alarmism. It's everywhere you look. On television, in newspapers, in popular magazines, in our schools, and in movie theaters. Politicians, government experts, and even Hollywood celebrities seem certain that global warming is a crisis. But are they correct? Probably not. A recent survey of more than 500 climate scientists worldwide found fewer than half believe that the science of climate change is sufficiently established to form the basis of public policy. More than 31,000 scientists have signed a petition saying there is no convincing scientific evidence that human release of carbon dioxide, methane, or other greenhouse gases is causing or will in the foreseeable future cause catastrophic heating of the Earth's atmosphere and disruption of the Earth's climate. Dr. Harrison Schmidt received his PhD in geology from Harvard University and was an astronaut on Apollo 17. He is the last living man to have walked on the moon. I think the public is, in fact, being ill-served by the debate not being a scientific debate, but a scientific-slash-political debate, and particularly where there are some uh, uh, scientists, uh, mostly uh, of a political leaning, uh, to that uh, say uh, the issue is settled and we don't need to debate it anymore. Well, there's no science that I've ever been aware of that doesn't need some debate. Uh, even now, we're, we keep debating some aspects of Einstein's uh, uh, theory of relativity. A hypothesis is really what is the better term for both the uh, suggestion that human beings are causing uh, global warming and the, su the alternate suggestion, which I think is more likely the case based on history and science, uh, that uh, it is a natural phenomena that uh, is going to uh, continue for a while and then probably going to change, just like it has in the past. Why then do we so often hear the claim that global warming is our fault and is a crisis? Dr. S. Fred Singer was the founding dean of the School of Environmental and Planetary Sciences at the University of Miami and founding director of the National Weather Satellite Service. I've been at this for about 50 years, since the beginning of the space age. About 20 years ago, I became alarmed because I saw that the science was being misused to hype the situation and found that there was really nothing to it. In other words, I found that the human influence was not important. Thousands of scientists are involved in studies that relate to climate change and global warming. Obviously, they have to gain support for their work and this costs money. And the, most of the money stems from the federal government. The federal government has a position, so it's not surprising that many scientists feel that they have to support one way or another, implicitly or explicitly, a political position which says that this is an important environmental issue and we've got to do something about it. Other prominent scientists agree Dr. Jay Lair is science director at the Heartland Institute. The pressure on scientists to support global warming is huge because there's $5 billion in research funds available from the federal government annually to uh, all the universities in America. Dr. Richard Lindzen is a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and one of the world's most distinguished physicists. If you are questioning global warming, you'll get bad reviews in your paper. Your proposals will be poorly reviewed. And for young scientists, uh, you know, this is crucial. Uh, it'll affect your funding, it'll affect your publication, it'll affect your promotion. Dr. Patrick Michaels was a professor of climatology at the University of Virginia and the Virginia State climatologist until he spoke out against global warming alarmism. The pressure that's exerted on scientists to not rock the boat on global warming is pretty intense. As you know, several state climatologists, including myself, either lost their positions or uh, quit because they couldn't say what was the truth about the issue. Dr. Harrison Schmidt has also observed the pressure applied to many scientists. Many of my uh, colleagues and people that I run into in geology and other related professions have told me that if they do not include in their grant proposals some uh, implication of a 
global warming relevance that they cannot get funded or are much less likely to get funded in the grant that they're proposing to undertake. And that, that's just wrong. It shouldn't be that way. These, uh, the government agencies, the foundations, should be evaluating these proposals on their basic scientific merit, uh, the quality and experience of the researchers and the team of researchers that are involved, and not on any pol uh, implication that there is a, uh, a corporate position or a, a government position that has to be fulfilled. Uh, it's just wrong. It's just not the way science should be done. Mr. Larry Schwager, who is the president and CEO of the National Wildlife Federation. Most reporters who cover global warming rely on spokesmen for environmental organizations as their it's sources. It's not an exaggeration to call what we're facing a climate crisis. But how likely are they to tell the truth? Joseph Bast, president of the Heartland Institute, wonders. The way that you grow your organization in the environmental movement is you talk about crises and you call for action. Uh, you don't make speeches about how the world is getting better and cleaner over time. Uh, you don't say we don't need to keep working on this problem, it's been solved. Uh, you say it's, it's even worse than we thought and we need to do even more on it. So you have these career guys running environmental groups, uh, increasingly in government agencies as well, um, who when you criticize them or when you talk about the science, now you're talking about their rice bowl. You're actually challenging their, their career opportunities. Politicians are also a common source used by reporters covering the global warming issue. How reliable are they? Dr. Lindzen. This is not the first time that uh, science has been invoked on the part of a political agenda. Uh, but it's certainly one of the more impressive examples. People like Al Gore, from the beginning, see this as a political vehicle and see science as something they can conveniently exploit. Uh, but that's inevitably the case when politics gets into science. John Coleman, a meteorologist and founder of the Weather Channel and the original weather forecaster for Good Morning America, agrees. Al Gore's no scientist, you understand. He had two science courses, got C in one, D in the other at Harvard. And uh, the professor who was his mentor who he wrote about in his book, uh, Earth and Balance, in 1992, and said started him on this campaign to save planet Earth from CO2 global warming. That professor, Roger Revelle, changed his mind. In fact, many experts believe the problem of global warming is being exaggerated by politicians who are set on raising taxes and punishing manufacturers. Lord Christopher Monckton was a science advisor to Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. Should governments throw money at global warming at a time of global economic crisis? The short answer is no. The long answer is if they're already printing fiat money, like there was no tomorrow, diluting the dollar in your pocket every time they switch on the printing press, the last thing you want them also to do is to print fiat carbon by setting up carbon cap and trade, which really means carbon tax and tax. You'll be paying twice over. You'll be paying to make the traders rich while you get poorer and the economy goes down the plug. There is no global warming crisis. There never was any global climate crisis. There isn't going to be one. Not a single cent of taxpayers' dollar should be wasted on this fraud. Roy Innes is national chairman of the Congress of Racial Equality, the third oldest civil rights organization in the United States. The hysteria among energy is going to cause a, a, a panic in the economic sectors, and, and we see that. The housing crisis, the banking crisis, the, the, the Wall Street crisis. There are those who profit from these kinds of crises, create a crisis, create a hysteria in the society, and in that condition of upheaval, you take over, you get power. Pamela Gorman is a state senator in Arizona. When you want to create a policy, you've got to create a problem, and you have to find a way to blame the problem on the people you want to create policy to control. And it's you see it all the time. It's always done where okay, we want this group of people to do something differently. So we've got to find something to pin on one of their behaviors so that we can then create policy to control that behavior. It seems to me it maybe started out with some people with some crooked science 
but they saw that they had some real power to maybe move towards a different type of government policy and controlling people's life. Can anything be done to stop global warming alarmism? Yes. One organization has done more than any other to set forth the true science and economics of global warming, the Heartland Institute a national nonprofit research and education organization based in Chicago has distributed more than two million books, videos, and studies showing why global warming is not a crisis. Joseph Bast is the president of the Heartland Institute. Politicians love a crisis because they get to pose as the guy who can solve that. Uh, I'm here from the government, I'm here to help you. Vote for me and we're going to take care of this environmental problem, we're going to get rid of this terrible thing, tax these guys, and, and save the earth. It's a cheap, easy campaign slogan for a politician. Um, so it's no surprise that Al Gore tried to build a political career on that. There's no surprise that members of Congress are out there talking about massive cuts in emissions, uh, which are just technologically impossible. Uh, but why do they care? Uh, it's a good soundbite. It uh, shows that they're informed and compassionate, and people seem to be willing to vote for that. We're an organization that was developed entirely to bring factual information to elected state and local officials. They're our target. We want to bring objective, non-biased information on a wide variety of issues, including the environment, the climate, uh, health care, education, uh, tax reform, to the guy at home that has to vote in his state on issues or the mayor of a big city or his uh, city council. Uh, everything we do is just providing unbiased uh, information. And, it, it, and if there's a slant, it's just personal freedom and a market-based approach. Heartland has been about getting the word out on climate change for a long time. It's been, it's been a leader. Their leadership is now having a synergistic effect with the other think tanks that may be more prominent and everybody is getting behind what these guys started. The Heartland Institute has hosted three international conferences on climate change featuring prominent scientists who oppose global warming alarmism. These conferences have generated extensive press attention in the United States and worldwide. The whole idea is just to create a platform for scientists and policy experts from other organizations to meet their peers and to get their message out, to get the press and policymakers to finally pay attention to some of these really brilliant scientists who have been trying to speak truth to power all these years and have been ignored. I mean, that's a great thing. That's, that's why I get up in the morning. Heartland's conference in 2008 was a milestone. The conference in 2009 has taken us to a whole new level. This is very important in the battle against the bad science that's behind global warming. All of the skeptics were scattered across the planet, didn't know each other, didn't relate to one another, didn't share their information with each other, had no publications in which to publish their papers, had no opportunity to answer each other's questions about their work. And uh, so then we came together here at the Heartland Conference in 2008 and suddenly I met all of the people whose papers I had been reading on the internet. I met the people who uh, I really wanted to know and I had a chance to, to interchange with them. And those of us who had felt lost and alone and beaten on the issue of the bad science behind global warming suddenly knew that we had momentum and we had uh, professional friends and our numbers were much larger than they had been uh, believed to have been. The Heartland Institute has played a huge role because they at one time were pretty much the only voice that was coordinating the the scientists that supposedly didn't exist, Hartland went out and found them and brought them together. I'm quite amazed at the attendance to the conference and the people who indeed are here. They're the giants in the field. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not sure who's been left out, but I know the people here are, are among those that I have seen through the years authoring the best basic research papers in the subject of climate change. And for uh, an institute like Hartland on its second conference, uh, to have drawn this remarkable group of people together uh, and have them talking to each other, debating each other on the details of their research, uh, that is a, a remarkable uh, achievement. 
And uh, I, I go to a lot of conferences, particularly in my own field of uh, lunar science, and uh, it's rare to see uh, this many of the top players in one place at the same time. One of the most popular keynote speakers at Heartland's 2008 and 2009 conferences in New York was Vaclav Klaus. Klaus lived under communist rule and is disturbed by the parallels between radical environmentalism and communism. For me in the communist era, something like think tanks of that kind, of course, did not exist. So, so it, it was an impossible institution. And the Heartland Institute is for me one of the leading American institutions of that kind. And I, I collaborated with several of them. I had speeches, awards from those, those institutions. Uh, so for me to discover Heartland, to, to get in touch with it uh, two years ago, Ago was for me a revealing experience and, and I think they helped to, to, to communicate to the Americans the difference in opinions and, and their advertising me and Al Gore uh, it was really something totally new. Thanks to the efforts of the Heartland Institute and its many allies, the prospects for defeating global warming alarmism are good. I think we're making enormous progress. A Rasmussen poll shows that 51% of Americans are now skeptical of global warming. And I think much of that can be credited to the gathering of these skeptical scientists with Heartland's help and all of the internet communication that has taken place, all the talk radio, all of the print articles, all of the, uh, the, the outreach that has been conducted over the last year. We're making a lot of progress. I followed this issue for 30 years. It's why I went into the science that I went into. And in the last month, I have seen opposition and anger and the moderates being stirred up much more than they ever have with the arrival of the Obama administration and the new Congress, the silent people have suddenly started to speak, and they are speaking very, very loudly on this issue. People realize there's something very strange about this issue, that, you know, when it's snowing, it's due to global warming. When it's raining, it's due to global warming. When there's drought, it's due to global They know th there's something uh, unscientific about that. After all, science is about testing things. If something is proved by anything, no matter what happens, it's not science. I think most people find it a bit strange when scientists say, well, yes, we didn't anticipate that it wouldn't warm for 13 years, but uh, we assure you it'll start again in 30 years. And then to legislate on the basis of that, and to, in addition, call somebody who denies that it will resume in 30 years a, a Holocaust-type denier. Uh, you know, the whole thing is sufficiently insane that one hopes people wake up to it. Will Congress pass and the President sign into law legislation that raises energy costs and destroys jobs unnecessarily? Will global warming alarmism continue to dominate the public debate? The future is up to you. Visit the Heartland Institute's websites at www.heartland.org or www.globalwarmingheartland.org and encourage your friends to do the same. Learn more about these issues and write to your members of Congress. Tell them global warming is not a crisis and that you oppose higher energy costs. Tell them it's time to stop global warming alarmism.